Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our class today with Gary Morris. Um, I've had the opportunity to attend many of Gary's classes in the last several years, and I find them absolutely fascinating. So I find it a real privilege to be able to introduce him today. Is it working? Um, just a little bit of background on Gary. Um, he is a member of HASP. Uh, he has a bachelor's in economics, um, an MSc in artificial intelligence, and a PhD in machine learning. Uh, for the last 10 years of his federal career, he was chief of the IRS artificial intelligence lab. So uh, let's give a warm welcome to Gary. I'm sure we're gonna have a wonderful time today. They tell me it's okay to take the mask off when I'm up here. I'm glad to do that. Yeah. Okay, are you all hearing me here? And Susan, if you're not hearing me uh, on Zoom, please let me know. Sounds great. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, as you heard in the introduction, I'm an AI guy and uh, won't be very long in this uh, lecture before you'll be wondering what in the world does artificial intelligence have to do with the subject of demography? And the answer is you'll have to come back next week to find out. Uh, today, we're going to well, okay, we have our first glitch. The slides are not. Pardon? Okay, there we go. So, um, one of the basic questions in life is can we know the future? And uh, Yogi Berra certainly had an answer. He said the future is very hard to predict, especially in advance. Uh, and I, I have some personal experience with this. Many years ago, I was traveling through Arkansas with uh, one of the famous uh, administrative officers for the IRS for that uh, Arkansas district. We were driving through the, the, uh, the mountains there. And uh, as we were going on a very narrow road up this twisty mountain rail, all of a sudden around a curve came this pickup truck and the guy was swerving wildly and just, he was in our lane, then he was back on the other side. It looked like it was going to go over the edge. And the guy was absolutely nuts, and we were scared to death he was going to hit us. He finally got to his own side, and as he went by, he had the nerve to holler out, hog. <laughs> we were in our own lane. We were incensed. Well, we, we, we drove on and went around the corner, and there was an 800-pound Arkansas Razorback, and we hit him and went off the cliff, and we both died. <laughs> Now, now, the moral of the story is you can know the future if you know how to interpret the signals. We didn't interpret hog correctly, and, and it had serious consequences. Well, demography is one of those subjects where, in effect, predicting the future, at least in the short range, is extremely easy. If you want to know how many 50-year-olds there are going to be 50 years from now, just count the babies certain percentage of them will die, but the rest of them are all going to be 50-year-olds. 50 years from now, you've just predicted a future population. Uh, now, if you get beyond, say, 100 years, it gets a little bit dicier. But demography, uh, the subject of this two-session class, uh, is basically involved with populations, large groups of people, and predicting their numbers and composition. Um, Today, we're gonna to be talking about the Malthusian hypothesis, and we'll talk about who Malthus was. Uh, we're gonna spend a little time giving a brief history of population. We're gonna talk about the twin revolutions that enabled a massive change in population on the globe. And we're gonna talk about a very important model called the demographic transition model. Um, we'll then talk about what it is that's driving a current phenomenon, which is population decline. Uh, we'll look at a few case studies in both developed and developing countries. We'll finally talk about the conflicting projections about what's going to happen on our planet from now until the end of the century. 
And finally, I will give my conclusions about the most likely global population projection. And you'll notice that artificial intelligence is nowhere in that outline. However, next week, we'll talk about the implications of population decline. First of all, why it is that uh, politically, that's a very unpopular topic. We'll do a case study of the US social security system. Uh, we'll talk about immigration, which is uh, certainly a hot topic these days. And then we'll talk about automation and robotics, and whether or not that is in fact going to be the solution to the problems caused by population decline. We'll even get to talk about robots and social security, robots and taxes. So let's launch into it. Now, demographics is about numbers, numbers of people, numbers of births, numbers of deaths. And that can sometimes seem like a pretty dry topic. But I want you to remember behind it all, we're talking about babies. We're talking about children, why we have them, why we have the number of them that we have, and what affects those decisions. That's really what demographics is about. So try to keep that in mind when we get into the dry numbers. Thomas Malthus was a uh, British cleric or, or pastor. Um, he lived in the uh, late 18th and early 19th century. Uh, as was the case in England at that time, uh, he was employed by the government because there was a state church. And as such, he was entitled to an education, which made him one of the few educated people in his parish. Like many clerics, uh, he studied a lot of things, and he became well known as both an economist and a general scholar. Now, he had a hypothesis that has become associated with his name. In 1798, he wrote an essay on the principle of population. What he has, had done was to look at history as it was recorded at that time and say, you know, what is it that, that seems to be the trend in, in populations in various nations? He noticed that whenever there was an improvement in food supply, at least temporarily, that improved living conditions. And when people had better living conditions, they tended to have more children and more of those children would survive. Therefore, you would have population growth. But as he observed, population growth is an exponential function. Agricultural improvement is a linear function. Linear functions are like two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 15, whatever. But an exponential function is like two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64, 128, and so on any exponential function will quickly overwhelm any linear function. And what he saw was that the exponential growth of population could quickly overcome any agricultural improvements. Therefore, he concluded, humanity is doomed to breed itself into starvation. Uh, not a very popular conclusion, but nonetheless, one that uh, was given serious consideration because of the uh, tight arguments that he made in support. So his conclusion was that history treats us to the fact that starvation and epidemics are the only things that actually restrain total population. Those are the things that are the reason why population does not explode exponentially. Well, in Malthus' day, global population had just reached 1 billion souls. And he considered that to be a sign that the population was in fact going to grow to the point where quickly people would be starving to death. Well, today the global population is 7.8 billion. That's a whole lot more than Malthus saw in his day. So was he right? Well, if he was wrong, where did he go wrong? Why didn't humanity breed itself into starvation? Did he get the fundamentals wrong? Or did he really have the fundamentals right, but he was simply ahead of his time? That's the question we're going to address today. Let's look at a brief history of global population. Uh, on this chart, you'll note that we start at the year 10,000 BC and go up to 2019. Uh, this is the famous curve known as the hockey stick curve because it is perfectly flat until you get to an inflection point and then whoop, it goes almost straight up. Now, 
on this curve, you can see that population was stable from about 10,000 BC to well into the Christian era. Why was population so stable for so long? Well, first of all, because survival was hard. Uh, there was no such thing as medicine. There was no such thing as uh, really any organized health. Uh, if you got sick, you died. That was it. Um, childbirth was strictly a family phenomenon, and it was not always successful. Life expectancies were very short. Um, furthermore, uh, for most of that period of time, uh, people were lived in hunter-gatherer societies. And in those societies, you need a lot of land to support even a small group. So population couldn't grow very large, or you would in fact face starvation. There were also near extinction events. Uh, there were climate change issues back then. Uh, and there were also issues of uh, wars and epidemics that in some cases almost extinguished entire populations. Pandemics or periodic epidemics were a major factor inhibiting population growth. Uh, these days, if you ask people about uh, pandemics in the past, we think of either the Spanish flu of 100 years ago or maybe the Black Death of six or 700 years ago. But there were lots and lots of epidemics that virtually wiped out populations. Well, let's shorten our time horizon and look at just the last thousand years. Notice that the hockey stick is still pretty much there. Um, but if you look at the global population in around the year 1000, it appears to be less than 500 million. The scale is in billions. Uh, and that's pretty much the case until you get almost to the end. And then it explodes up to in 2010, when this graph uh, ended, 6.9 billion people. So there was very slow growth, even in the second millennium of history. Um, this was because we had feudal agriculture, uh, which was not terribly efficient. There were lots of wars and famines, uh, as European history certainly demonstrates. Uh, the Black Death made a serious dent. If you look at this chart, right around the year 1400, you see a dip in global population. Now, the Black Death was mostly focused in Europe, but it was so devastating that it actually took a big bite out of global population for a period of about 100 years. Now, technology was slowly improving. Uh, sailing ships, printing, and et cetera, was starting to happen, but population growth was pretty slow for most of the, the period. Let's shorten the time horizon again. Let's look at just the last 300 years. And we're looking primarily uh, from an American perspective at this, because by 1700, there were Europeans living on this continent. Notice that it took until about the date of Malthus publication in 1800 for the world to reach 1 billion people. And it took another 120 years to get to 2 billion. And then the time required to add another billion really got short. What was going on there? Well, these last 225 years were very different from all of human history before. There was, first of all, a rapid growth of trade. Why does that matter? Well, because trade allows populations or civilizations to specialize in what they're good at, and then trade for things that they're not good at. This makes everyone more wealthy, therefore able to afford uh, better health care. There was also an industrial revolution, which dramatically increased the productivity of all humans, well, at least all humans in the develop developing world. There was also an agricultural revolution, which again made a dramatic improvement. And finally, uh, during this period of time, you had European societies, which tended to have a high population density, settling or invading or colonizing previously low-density continents. So Africa, which had been a very low-density population for all of its history, all of a sudden was invaded by people from Europe who thought that um, towns with lots of people crowded together were just the norm. So all of these factors combined 
to contribute to a very rapid increase in global population. Well, once again, let's uh, narrow our focus and look at just the last 120 years. The 20th century really does dominate the whole global population story. At the beginning of the 20th century, there was less than 2 billion people on the planet. And as of right now, there are approximately 7.8 billion people on the planet. A humongous difference in only 100 years. And as you can see, this graph projects out into the future, showing that population is expected to continue to increase. Now, the reasons for this are all happy ones. Uh, the biggest reason why population has exploded in the 20th century is infant mortality. 120 years ago, it was not at all uncommon for a pregnancy to end in an unhappy event. Either the pregnancy didn't go full term or a child was born but could not survive. The, the death rate among children under five was still pretty significant. But at the beginning of the 20th century, we had some things like medicine and people becoming more and more affluent so they could afford things like doctors. And infant mortality absolutely plummeted starting in the 20th century. Modern medicine began to be practiced. And this, again, increased life expectancy by quite a bit. Something else that was going on was urbanization and industrialization. Now, those both tended to raise living standards. And when people had more money, they could spend it on health care. It made a huge difference. And of course, then after World War II, we had a global baby boom, which certainly helped things along. I said that there were two revolutions that really were major factors in population growth. Uh, the first one was the Industrial Revolution. Uh, the steam engine was uh, first developed in uh, the early 1700s, but James Watt, in the middle of the 18th century, really made the steam engine into a usable device. Uh, today, a factory is a place where people go to work with machines to make things. That's a shortened, verm, uh, shortened version of the original term, which was manufactories. A manufactory was a place where people went to manufacture, by hand, make things. That was a form of industrial organization that certainly was helpful, but when you add steam power to that, all of a sudden, it was an explosion of productivity. And then, toward the end of the 1800s, we had another new power, electric power. Uh, Thomas Edison, Nikola Tesla changed the world. Now, you might think that that wasn't going to make a big difference in the Industrial Revolution because they already had steam power. But think about it. In this uh, illustration that you see here, this was a steam-powered factory. The only way that you could get power to an individual machine was to have some kind of a steam engine somewhere off in the, in the corner uh, being tended by its own priests and priestesses. But then you had to have pulleys bringing that power to the rest of the factory where uh, you know, the pulley would go by a machine. You would have to pull power off that pulley onto the machine and so on. It was a little bit cumbersome. When electricity was introduced, all of a sudden, organizing a factory was much easier. All you needed to do was to run a cable from your electrical source to a machine and bingo, you had power wherever you wanted it easily distributed, easily reorganized. The other revolution was the agricultural revolution. And this was due to a number of factors. I mean, obviously, before the agricultural revolution, all farming was done with muscle power, originally human muscle power, but eventually oxes and mules. But when steam power became available, such as that steam powered tractor you see on the left, that changed everything. The ability of one person to do an enormous amount of work uh, suddenly was just a matter of getting a tractor. Another factor was that the steam enabled railroads. And in this country especially, the expansion of railroads literally opened up the country. Now, 
before there were railroads, even if you had a steam tractor, there was a limit on how much food you could grow because you had to sell it. And how far could you really travel to sell that, that food? Once you had railroads, it didn't matter how many people lived in your area or how hungry they were. You could produce as much as you could figure out how to produce, load it on a railroad car and cheaply transport it to a city or maybe even to a different continent where it could be sold. So the combination of industrialized agriculture and the transportation due to railroads made it possible to just tremendously increase the amount of food that could be produced. And finally, uh, something new was added in the United States. It was in the middle of the 1800s that the idea of agricultural research really took hold. Now, I am a proud graduate of Michigan State University, previously Michigan State College, and before that, Michigan Agricultural College. It was a land grant school, just like Ohio State, Iowa State, and all the other state universities. The whole purpose of land grant colleges was to conduct agricultural research to help local farmers do a better job of raising more and better crops. The combination of all these factors led to a literal explosion in the amount of food available. Well, these twin revolutions produced conditions that allowed rapid population growth in the United States. And in most other countries, they followed the same pattern, although maybe the timing was a little bit different. Rapid increases in farm productivity also meant that there were many fewer jobs on the farms, but that simply meant that there was now excess farm labor, which could move to the cities, which was really handy because the cities now had factories that needed lots of people. This led to a rising uh, national productivity per person or per capita GDP that enabled better access to better medical care, and again, child and adult mortality just dropped like a rock. Another factor was the westward expansion in this country where it was felt by everyone that we need more people because there's a whole Western frontier that we need to populate. So the idea that we need to have lots of people led to the cultural expectation of large families. Um, we did indeed move west and, of course, displaced indigenous people that had a much more balanced population philosophy. Um, and in Europe, colonialism had the same effect. They moved um, colonial Europeans, went to places like Africa, which had fairly stable populations, and introduced the idea of large families to help populate a, quote, barren continent. Well, that's our brief review of global population. And I'd like to stop at this point and say, do you have any questions about that? Because that's kind of fundamental to where we're going today. Any questions here in the classroom or on Zoom? Yes, Gary, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, the first person commented, uh, Malta suggested that low wages can be blamed upon the habits of the poor, the, that the poor themselves are the cause of their own poverty, and it's up to people themselves, not capitalistic institutions, to improve the lot of the poor. In a sense, he was saying personal responsibility is critical in improving one's own lot. And that was just simply a comment. Interesting comment. Okay. Um, who and how was population data measured in earlier centuries? Ah, good question. Um, what they asked was, where did we come up with all these population estimates for uh, way back when? And the answer, of course, is that um, actual population counts are a fairly recent phenomenon. Um, certainly in biblical times, the idea of, of a census was already well understood, but long before biblical times, there were no records. Uh, however, uh, historians and demographers were able to interpret clues such as uh, the size of cities. Say a city was discovered that seemed to date from about 5,000 BC. You can quickly determine how large a population that would have supported, how far away it was from other cities. You can do rough estimates. But it was no matter you know, what 
how you might quibble about individual discoveries, there was absolutely no question that the population of the entire planet was somewhere around a million people for a very long time because uh, hunter-gatherer societies just really could not support more than that. Thank you. That's the only thing in the chat at this time. Okay. Nothing, nothing else here? Oh, yes. Was there a major centralized role of the in thought? Was there an increase in centralized control? I assume you mean through government? Um, that That's outside my research. My personal speculation is that uh, the, the rise of central governments with some control over society probably was a slight net positive in terms of making life easier. Um, some of the people who lived under nasty kings might have disagreed with that. Uh, but yeah, the, the ability of governments to improve society probably did lead to a, a greater population. Okay, let's go on. Um, now I've just argued that urbanization and rising prosperity were big factors in supporting rapid population growth. Now I'm gonna argue that urbanization and prosperity are going to lead to reduced growth and eventually to population decline. Uh, this may seem like a contradiction, but uh, give me a chance to defend my argument. Before we do that, we need some tools and definitions from the science of demography. So let's look at some demographic terms. Um, two terms that you're gonna see a lot are birth rate and death rate. Now, what these mean is in any given year, the number of births or the number of deaths. So birth rate and death rate are annual statistics. On the other hand, we're gonna talk about a fertility rate. Now that is the average number of children that a woman bears over her entire lifetime. So it's not an annual statistic. It is something that we uh, have to measure over a fairly long period of time. Now you can estimate that by looking at the number of births compared to the number of women in their fertile years. And you can, you can estimate what the fertility rate is, but to really measure it, you have to measure how many children does the average woman have over her entire lifetime. A number that we're going to focus on a lot is 2.1. That is called the replacement rate. In other words, if every woman, or if on average, the women in a society have 2.1 children, that will lead to a stable population. Two would mean that she's replacing herself and her mate. 2.1 allows for the fact that there is still such a thing as mortality before a female reaches her productive years. So 2.1 is universally acknowledged as the replacement rate. When a population is experiencing that fertility rate, it is a stable population. So I said that uh, 2.1 will produce a stable population, I should say eventually, because uh, if the, the fertility rate has been something else and then reaches 2.1, it takes a while for that to have a complete effect. Now, it's definitely the, the case that when the birth rate equals the death rate, the population has reached stability. So when those two rates are equal, immediately population is stable. Now, in all cases, we're gonna be ignoring migration. Uh, when I'm talking about global population, Migration simply involves people going from someplace on the globe to someplace else on the globe, but it all washes out. So in global terms, we're just going to ignore that. Next week, we will not ignore it. I need to introduce you to a very famous model in uh, the science of demography called the demographic transition model. Um, I'll let you look at this for just a moment. You can see that it's tracking the birth rate, the death rate, and then the total population. Notice that there are five stages in this demographic transition model. We're gonna look at each one of those stages carefully. The demographic transition model was proposed by an American named Warren Thompson in 1929. Uh, he had simply 
looked at the history of all the developed nations, mostly European nations, and uh, studied what happened to their birth rates, their death rates, their fertility, and their total population. Now, the total population was simply a matter of math. If you assume that the birth rates and the death rates are what's shown on the model, then population is going to change simply by uh, the mathematical outcome of those two things. So the birth rate and the death rate are the critical variables. Thompson asserted that the birth and death rates shown are what actually happened in developed nations. And furthermore, he asserted that they are what will happen almost always in every nation on the globe in the future. Now, that was a fairly strong claim. He made that claim 90 years ago. And so far, the data to date indicates that he was exactly correct. So his demographic transition model is now considered to be just about settled science. Now, let's look at stage one of this demographic transition model. The death rate in blue is going to fluctuate because you have famines, you have wars, you have epidemics. The birth rate can go up and down. Excuse me, the death rate. Now, when the death rate peaks, the birth rate tends to decline, partly because there's a smaller number of parents and partly because those parents that have survived the epidemic or the war are perhaps reluctant to bring children into a dangerous world. But when the death rate and the fatalities drop, then the number of fertile couples rises, optimism about the future increases, and higher birth rates tend to replenish the population. This was the global picture for most of human history. Birth rates and death rates varied over time, but they tended to be stable in terms of population. Some groups flourished, others failed, but global population was low, but pretty stable. So stage one, although it's just one piece of this model, in fact, was a very, very long time period. Stage two of the transition model shows that all of a sudden the death rate drops. This relates to perhaps uh, the late 19th and early 20th century, when all of a sudden economic growth, better medicine, transportation improvements, all help to reduce the death rate. The life expectancy goes up by quite a bit. Now, the largest factor in this, of course, is reducing child mortality. As you'll recall, in the late 19th century, infant mortality was still a very big problem. It was not at all uncommon for people to believe that you had to have somewhere between eight and 12 pregnancies if you wanted to eventually have a male heir or maybe two or three children that survived to adulthood. When child mortality began to plummet, the death rate went down, but you'll note the pink line, the birth rate stays up. That's because birth rates decline much more slowly historically, and that makes sense because birth rates generally reflect cultural expectations. If everybody knows you have to have eight to 12 pregnancies if you're going to have children survive, you continue to have eight to 12 pregnancies even if in fact, more children are surviving and people are living longer. So it takes a while for a culture to absorb the fact that, oh, we don't have to have so many pregnancies in order to have a large family that survives. This was the pattern in all European countries that Thompson had uh, examined. And it was his feeling that it was the pattern throughout the world. Death rates drop first, birth rates drop later and slower. The inevitable result was a rapidly rising population. And this was exactly what Malthus saw. Malthus saw that in European and other developed countries, um, when you get to stage two, the population would increase at a very rapid rate. As I say, this has been the experience of nearly all developed and many developing nations. Well, stage three is when the birth rate starts to really catch up to reality and the birth rate begins to decline rapidly, even as the death rate continues to decline. 
Now, the death rate continues to decrease for all the reasons that we've already talked about. But the birth rates start to rapidly decline because ideals or cultural expectations for family size have changed. The number of births required to provide an adult heir or extra farm labor, all of that decreases and society begins to reflect it. However, the population continues to expand rapidly even though birth rates have fallen. Why is that? People are living longer because that death rate has continued. Um, look at the two lines. So long as the pink line, the birth rate, is higher than the blue line, you've got more people being born than are dying. By definition, your population is going up. So even in stage three, where the birth rate starts to decline precipitously, because the death rate is also continuing to decline, you've got every generation far more people being born than are dying, so the population increases and increases rather rapidly. That's why the orange line, the total population, is rising just as fast in stage three as it did in stage two. Now, stage four represents the time when birth rates and death rates have once again reached equilibrium. Population growth slows but it doesn't really stop growing for another 35 to 45 years. Why is that? The birth rate and the death rate are about the same, but why doesn't the population growth stop immediately? Medicine. Yes, people are living longer, but why would, it, why would there be a 35 to 45 year lag between the time when the birth and death rates are equal and the time when population growth levels off. There are more people. <laughs> well, there are more young people. Okay. Remember, just 35 years ago, there were still a lot more young people being born than people were dying. So even though the birth rate has now declined, for 35 or 45 years, you've still got people that were born back in that earlier expansion period, and they're in their fertile years, and they're going to have now fewer babies, but still there's a lot of them. Uh, think about the baby boom in this country. Uh, even after the baby boom, we had the birth dearth. Uh, there was a correction. But so long as you have a lot of boomers who are in their reproductive years, you're going to have population growth. That's exactly what the United States saw. So first population growth slows. And then later, the age mix becomes balanced. Why? Because it takes a while for that big baby boom to slowly work its way through the population. But eventually, the age mix levels out, so you have roughly uh, the same number of people in every uh, age category. Now, stages one through four are simply what Thompson observed in world history. He had observed countries that, according to all their records, went through stage one. They all started there. Then they went through stage two and stage three and had now reached stage four. Um, Thompson was simply reporting what he saw, but he had a great insight. And that was that this is not the end of the story. Because there is a stage five, he said. Now, in stage five, you'll notice the blue line continues to fluctuate. The pink line continues to decline. That's because the death rate can only go so low. I mean, no matter how long you live, you die once. But there is no limit to how low the birth rate can go. People can decide to have three kids, they can decide to have two kids, they can decide to have one kid, they can decide they don't want any kids. There's no lower limit. In nearly every nation, the birth rate has continued to decline even after birth and death rates equalized. Now, this is when we start to talk about the fertility rate. When the fertility rate drops below 2.1, which is what we're seeing in stage five, each generation is smaller than the previous one, and eventually population declines. 
virtually all developed nations on this planet are in stage five. Again, ignoring migration. All developed nations on this planet are in stage five, which means all of them have birth rates lower than their death rate. Now, even some developing nations are in stage five, which is a little counterintuitive. They haven't yet experienced the greater affluence, the greater industrialization that you would think would cause the birth rates to decline. And yet, in developing countries, we have stage five. Now, that demographic transition model is really important. So I want to stop here and say, do we have any questions about that? Nothing here in the room. Anything online? Oh, yes, we do. Wait, wait just a moment for the microphone so the Zoom people can hear you. Excellent question, and we're going to deal with that in just a minute. But yes, you're right. That was an important factor. Could you repeat the question? I couldn't oh, hear the it. The question was, didn't some nations um, actually have government policies suggesting that people should have lower fertility? And the answer is yes. We're going to talk about that in just a few minutes. Ah. Thank you, Dave. In addition to um, just fertility, what about um, women who have uh, advanced in terms of Okay, the question was, well, what about the factors of uh, women gaining more control over their bodies and more control over their careers? Does this have an impact? I'll pay you later. That's a wonderful lead in. Uh, yes, what? Oh, another question or comment here. Wait just a moment. Similar question to Ruben's question. What's the effect of birth control? I'll pay you later. <laughs> the question was, well, what's the effect of birth control on all this? Demographers uh, who have now accepted the demographic transition model as settled science, that's just the way it works, have now addressed the question of why does the fertility drop below the replacement level? What is it that causes that to happen? And they have identified four factors that are nearly universal around the globe. Urbanization, birth control technology, education of women, and the decline of religious influence. Let's take a look at these. First of all, urbanization. Now you'll remember that I argued originally that urbanization led to great increases in uh, productivity. So people became uh, better able to afford health care, and this allowed uh, increases in population. But urbanization in the long run has a different effect. On a farm family, you need lots of children because children are extra hands. Children produce family resources. But if that family moves to a city, all of a sudden, the children are not extra resources. They consume resources. They're extra mouths to feed. So when a population goes from largely rural to largely urban, all the economic drivers of decisions about how many children to have get reversed. If you're, uh, if you're Abraham and Sarah, you want to have lots of kids or else lots of slaves because you've got a lot of uh, agricultural resources to manage. But if you're living in a city, uh, every child is a burden on the family economically, 
until they reach the productive age. And in our almost all societies, once they reach the productive age, they move away. So urbanization was a large factor in uh, reducing the economic incentive to have lots of children. Now, furthermore, when you move to the city, extended family doesn't have nearly as much influence as when you live in the same little small town with all of your other relatives. I mean, let's face it, grandparents tend to pressure couples to produce grandchildren. <laughs> your coworkers don't. So if you've left the town where grandma and grandpa live, and now you're living in the city, the social pressure to have more children is reduced. In the United States and Canada, right now, we are 80% urban. Globally, we are fast approaching 50% urban. And uh, the United Nations actually has a small team that is monitoring this, and they're going to announce the day when 51% of the world's population lives in cities. But urbanization is a phenomenon that seems to be unstoppable. In every country, urbanization is happening. Now, partly because of that, in the US, our fertility rate is 1.73. Remember, 2.1 is the replacement level. In the US, it's 1.73. Canada, 1.5. Urbanization is part of the reason why that has happened. Another part is birth control. Um, a famous woman said, no woman can call herself free who does not own and control her body. Anybody know who said that? Pardon? Margaret Sanger, yes. She uh, was born in the late 19th century and uh, lived until 1966. And that little lady started a revolution. In 1910, she moved to New York City and became a, a public health nurse. And she was very concerned by what she saw in the poorer neighborhoods of New York City. There were lots of women who were being injured and in some cases killed by botched abortion attempts. They could not afford to have another child. They tried to abort. It was done in a back alley or by some cheap practitioner. It was costing human lives. So Margaret Sanger started clinics, began forming organizations. Her big mantra was control over our own bodies. Well, as I say, she started a revolution. She worked to try to increase the ability of women to control their fertility. She coined the term birth control. That was her one of her contributions. She worked at it tirelessly and frankly, without a whole lot of success. At age 72 in 1951, she went to a dinner party and there she met an endocrinologist named Gregory Pincus. And never having given up her quest, she worked him the whole party. And by the time the party was over, she had convinced him that he ought to research a birth control pill. Three years later, human clinical trials began on Mr. Pincus' pill. Three years after that, the FDA approved the pill for women with menstrual disorders. And immediately, the number of women reporting menstrual disorders skyrocketed. It was only three years after that that the FDA finally just gave blanket approval for contraceptive use, and the rest is history. This was a major factor enabling reduced fertility rates when people wanted lower fertility rates. That was the third driver, or the second driver. The third one is the education of women. Now, in every culture to date, when women gain knowledge of how to control pregnancy and when they're allowed to have careers, they choose to have fewer children and they have them at a later age in every culture to date. Now, we may look at this as a good thing or a bad thing, but we have to remember, I think most people in this room are Christians, and you know we started this. It was Christianity that first began to elevate the status of women in society. It was a long haul, but 
We started it. In a late stage industrial and urban economy, there are always gonna be rising numbers of women in the workforce. And that requires education of women. In the US, high school grads going on to college, 72% of women, but only 61% of men. Education of women is not only the norm, it is a dominant factor. In the United States, 40% of chemists today are women. 30% of environmental scientists, geoscientists are women. In England, 55% of all medical students are women. Education of women is just a fact. And it is one of the factors inspiring women to decide to have fewer children and to have them later in life because they have to have time to gain that education then they have to have time to get started in a career and to build up some stability in their professional life before they can take time off to have children. Very practical consideration. But the bottom line is fertility rate goes down. The fourth factor identified by demographers is waning religious influence. Now, highly religious societies tend to have high fertility rates. They have noticed that wherever the Catholic Church has experienced rapid declines, fertility rates also rapidly decline. Latin America is a prime example. As we're all aware, the Catholic Church for centuries was a dominant force in Latin America, but that has been waning over the last 40 to 50 years. In Argentina in 1900, the fertility rate was over six. It's now 2.27. In Chile, 1905, the rate was 6.16, and it's now 1.65. In Brazil, the fertility rate was over six just 60 years ago. It's now 1.7. These are all Latin American countries where the Catholic Church was a dominant factor for most of their history. But as that religious influence has declined, birth rates have plummeted. Let's look at a case study. Uh, this is the flag of Spain. I'm sure you all recognize. Spain is certainly a very developed country. It has a current life expectancy of 82.5. In other words, its death rate is pretty low. That's the fourth highest life expectancy on the globe. Their fertility rate, 1.3. That is so far below 2.1, it is dramatic. Their death rate is low. But in Spain, there are two deaths for every birth today. In 2011, the population of Spain was 46.8 million. Even conservative projections of their population indicate that it will be 40.6 million in only 60 years. That's a decline of 13% in the nation's population in one lifetime. The European Union in general is experiencing low fertility rates. In England, it's 1.8. Belgium, the same. Germany, 1.57. Poland, it's less than 1.5. And a few years ago, they closed 200 schools in one year because they didn't have enough children. In Italy, the rate is 1.4. In 2015, there were fewer births in Italy than in any year since they began keeping records in 1861. In Slovakia, the birth rate is 1.4, and the population of that nation is already declining. Likewise, Greece, it's 1.3, population going down. Romania, 1.3, already losing population. In fact, for all of the European Union, and this was before Brexit, the average was 1.6. If you now subtract England with its 1.8 fertility rate, the rate is somewhat below 1.6. That's for all of Europe. Well, what about developing nations? Uh, maybe they're still uh, populating themselves quite well. Well, yes and no. 
most developing nations have not yet reached stage five in that demographic transmission middle, yet some of them are still seeing rapid declines in fertility. In other words, their birth rates and death rates have not yet stabilized. The birth rate is yet declining. How can that be? Well, let's take a look at Brazil. As I said, in 1960, the fertility rate was 6.06. .06. They had a strong history of Catholicism. And even today, 25% of people in Brazil live in poverty. In 1960, it was a whole lot worse. And yet, 2018, the fertility rate, 1.73, the same as here. Now, how could a nation with 25% of its people living in slums have the same fertility rate as the United States? Well, in fact, a team of scholars went to Brazil to try to answer that question. And what they found was surprising. They found that government programs felt that it was important to extend electricity to the slums. Um, I forget the, the name uh, that they have in Brazil for their slums, but there's a, I think it's favela? Favela, okay. Uh, the government decided that the favelas were full of poor people. They couldn't do a whole lot about it, but they could certainly extend the electric infrastructure into the favelas and allow people to perhaps, you know, lift themselves out of poverty. Well, with electricity came television, and with television came access to uh, what in Brazil are called telenovelas. We call them soap operas. These were stories that played during the day on television, and they were now available in the very poorest favelas in Brazil. Every one of those soap operas depicted small families and career women. Studies have shown that in every case, when electricity arrives in a favela, the birth rate drops sharply. Why? Well, um, because people were all of a sudden seeing cultural models that said small families, career women. And that's what they began to emulate. There was another factor too. Now in Brazil, government health insurance covers cesarean sections for childbirth. Now abortion is illegal, but for a small cash fee, doctors will add sterilization to a cesarean section. So the higher economic classes in Brazil which have rather affluent lives, choose small families for the same reasons that Europeans and Americans do. But the poor women choose small families because of TV role models and access to cheap sterilization. As a result, Brazil's fertility rate is quite low and it's not going to go back up. Now, I said that we were going to ignore migration uh, this time, we'll talk a lot about it next time. Um, that's because migration is simply population transfers between nations. Now, immigration is an important factor in the national story for every nation. We're gonna talk a lot about that next week. But uh, for global population terms, we can ignore it because it all washes out. You can't talk about population without talking about the two most populous nations on this planet, China and India, and some of their government policies, as you folks have pointed out. One third of the world's population lives in these two countries. So whatever is true in these two countries is definitely going to have a strong influence on the whole planet. Now, both of these countries are developing rapidly. And China's development, of course, is, is famous. They are developing at an incredible breakneck rate. In China, they decided quite a few decades ago that uh, they had too many people and they wanted to introduce a one-child policy. That policy was in effect for 30 years. And in fact, it produced very few children an unattended consequence was it produced a high proportion of males. Uh, you can probably imagine why. In Chinese culture, a male heir was very important culturally. And so, uh, strangely enough, 
when a female child was born, they frequently did not survive the process, but male children did. So there was a very high proportion of males born for a 30 year period. Fertility rates plummeted. In 1960, the Chinese fertility rate was 6.2. By 79, during the one child policy, it had dropped to 2.5. By 2015, it had dropped to 1.6. Now, these are official Chinese uh, statistics. And I am told by uh, demographers that I have read that uh, if you go get a couple of beers with a Chinese academic, they'll quickly conclude that those official figures are artificially high. China does not want to acknowledge the fact that they are approaching a shrinking population. So they officially claim a higher fertility rate than they have, but even their official rate is 1.6, well below the replacement rate. This has a big impact on the age mix. In 1960, the median age in China was 21. Now you know what that means. That means a young, vigorous population, basically healthy, uh, entering their economic productive years, Boy, you can sure do economic development quickly when you've got a population that's that age. By 2015, the average age, in, the median age in China is 38. And by 2050, just 30 years from now, it is expected to be 50. A population where half of all your people are 50 and over is not one that's going to support rapid economic development. It's not one that's going to support uh, innovation and uh, increased productivity nearly as much as they experienced years ago. And I mentioned that high proportion of male births. Right now, China is dealing with a large population of unmarried, sexually frustrated young men. This is a political problem. It's also an economic problem. Um, China is experiencing, in some cases, the importation of females from other Asian nations as brides. And they're also experiencing the emigration of Chinese young men leaving the country simply so that they can become married. One of the demographers that I read had an interesting quote. He said, China is becoming Japan. Japan, of course, has one of the oldest populations on the globe. He said, China's becoming Japan, but Japan got rich before it became old, and China won't be so lucky. The other large nation, of course, is India. Now, Indian society is very patriarchal and highly religious. It's not Catholic. It's mostly Hindu and, and uh, uh, Buddhist, but those are still uh, very traditional religions put a high value on large families. India experienced extremely rapid, rapid population growth in the 20th century. In fact, in 1950, when all of us were around, India had only 376 million people. By 2000, that was 1 billion souls. Fertility rates, back in 1950, 5.9. And even today, it's above 2.1. In 2015, it was 2.4. So India, one of the few nations on earth that still has a fertility rate higher than the replacement rate. And that's a fertility rate measured over a very large number of females. Now, India is not dumb. They realize that this is causing a problem. They have all the people that they want and more. So current national policy and many state government policies are promoting small families. At the national level, they have a program called We Too, Our Too. The idea is that we too are happy, we're gonna have our two children, and we're gonna quit. That is a goal that clearly is not yet fully adopted because their fertility rate is 2.5. But the national government recognizes that they need to get the fertility rate down, and this is one of their attempts. Now, in some of the state governments, not all, but in some, um, they are offering free sterilizations to any woman that wants one. And there are 
reports that sometimes these sterilizations are being uh, encouraged very strongly. Uh, it's implied even that some of them are forced. That is how strongly some of the state governments believe that they have to lower their fertility rate or they're simply going to run out of room. Another factor, uh, certainly in the more affluent states and cities in India, is that India places a very high value on education. And the strong desire to provide an expensive education for a child is a real economic motivation for holding it to two children. Because the more children you have, the more you have to educate, or you're just not a good parent. So, with all of these factors considered, uh, there are conflicting projections. Uh, for China, the United Nations has a population division. This is an organization that's been around for a long time. Its original reason for existence was that they were encouraging nations to conduct a census periodically because they felt it was important to know how many people are living in any one country. That goal has been pretty much achieved worldwide. But now their major objective is to record and project the population for each nation for lots of reasons. The UN Population Division has projected that fertility will increase to the end of this century. They say, and I've got a typo here, <laughs> it says population will be 1 billion. No, UN says population will be 11 billion by the end of this century. Current population 7.8, they are projecting 11 billion. Now, academic demographers have a different view. Uh, most of them believe that fertility is going to be holding at 1.4 or 1.5 in almost all countries around the globe through the end of the century. They believe that the population in China will be 650 to 750 million by 2100. Now that's 600 million fewer people than they've got right now. 600 million people going away in one country. Admittedly, it's a big country, but that is a huge drop by the end of this century. In India, uh, we have uh, a similar, and, and I need to correct myself. I realized when I was talking about China, I said I had a typo. The UN population division is projecting that global population will be 11 billion by 2100. China's population, they project, will be 1 billion. Okay, not a typo. In India, uh, the UN population division says that fertility is going to remain above the replacement rate through the end of the century. And they're projecting that the population of India will be 1.7 billion just 40 years from now. Academics see it differently. Uh, they think that fertility may have already dropped to the replacement level in actuality. They think the population will peak at only about one and a half billion and will decline to 1.2 billion by the end of the century. Now, you might wonder why these conflicting projections exist. Um, there is no official answer to that. The UN Population Division says we're right. Academics say we respectfully disagree. What they talk about off the record is that the UN Population Division seems to think that India and China and some of the developing nations in Africa and Asia are going to overpower the declining fertility in the developed nations. There's no doubt that Europe, the United States, and other developed nations are going to see declining population. But they think that these developing nations will overpower that. That's why they think that world population will reach 11 billion by 2100 and then maybe stabilize at that level. Now, if climate change plus a 41% increase in hungry mouths strains the food supply beyond what it can bear, Maybe Malthus was right, but just ahead of his time. However, the academic demographers say, no, the United Nations is keeping fertility rates unrealistically high for political reasons. 
China is a pretty big stick these days. China's official fertility rates are much higher than what most academics believe is true. China denies that their population will ever decline. We'll talk about the reasons for that next week. But many academics believe that these political fertility rates are just unrealistically high. They project the consensus is that world population will increase to about 9 billion by 2050. But after that, it's going to decline to 7 billion by 2100 and continue to decrease thereafter. They feel that stage five is permanently where the world will be by 2100. Now, 7 billion in 2100, that's 800 million people less than we have right now. So if we can eliminate waste in the food supply chain, if we can deal with climate change, then we can feed 9 billion people in 2050. And then the population pressure on food supply will decline. So if the academics are right, Malthus made a good argument, but he did not foresee the other factors. Malthus was wrong. My personal conclusion is that I think the academic demographers have a whole lot more data to support their predictions. I think the UN is in fact trying to be politically correct and it's causing their projections to be much too high. I believe that global population will indeed peak at 9 billion around 2050 and decline thereafter for the foreseeable future. That's my personal conclusion worth exactly what you paid for it. <laughs> so was Malthus right? Well, if the academic people are, are right, then they say if we can be, feed 7.8 billion now, we can feed 7 billion people in 2100, no problem. But there's a big asterisk on all of these projections and that's climate change. Agricultural capacity right now is higher than it has ever been in world history. Some would say climate change is gonna affect that. Now, as uh, someone observed on Monday when talking about uh, the warming Arctic, um, yeah, the corn growing zone in the United States is moving north. Fortunately, there is good land north of Iowa. Um, so we can probably, if we culturally adapt to changing our, our expectations for what crops you grow in Minnesota, we can probably maintain our corn production uh, through this phase of climate change. Yeah. What happens if it uh, keeps going north? Well, the Canadians will be happy. Uh, we might not be. But agricultural capacity, we don't know whether climate change may severely reduce it. Um, if the ocean levels indeed rise as much as some have projected, we're going to have massive evacuations of coastal cities. That's going to have a big impact on distribution systems. Now, a couple of years ago, everybody would have said, so what? Now that we've seen what happened to supply chains with just a pandemic, we can understand disturbing distribution patterns and supply chains can be a big deal. It can have real consequences. And then there's the oceans. Right now, we have dying reefs. We have various uh, fish and other things in the oceans that are having declining populations, partly due to overfishing, but partly due to climate change. What will happen if, as uh, the gentleman on Monday suggested, if the uh, melting Arctic ice doesn't allow as much kelp to grow? Um, we don't know. These are all unknowns. And obviously, if all of these answers are unhappy ones, well, maybe Malthus will have a point. But it won't be because of population. It'll be because of climate change. So that's all we have to talk about today. I turned my phone off, so I have no idea what time it is. But we um, are at about 1043. So you've done very well, but you have some questions oh. in the chat. If we can look at those maybe first. Okay, let me just mention, uh, this is what we're gonna talk about next week. We're gonna talk about why nations fear population decline. We're gonna look at the US social security system as a case study in demographic change. We'll talk about immigration. We're going to talk about my favorite subject, automation and robotics, and so on. Now, we have questions on the chat. 
Awesome, thank you. Yeah, we the first comment was someone just uh, commenting that you are a fascinating, fluent, terrific, smart pre uh, presenter and speaker. And thank you, sweetheart. I didn't know you. <laughs> I didn't know my wife have, was on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have um, a question, has personal responsibility diminished in, in importance? Has personal responsibility diminished in importance? And, uh, how, and will this affect growth is the follow-up to that. And will this affect population growth? That's an interesting question, uh, one I haven't really thought about until now, so I'll just give you a shoot from the hip opinion, which you are welcome to disagree with. Um, personal responsibility implies an individual feeling responsibility to society as large, as well as to themselves. Um, if people feel that uh, maintaining a low birth rate is important for our nation, then perhaps a sense of personal responsibility would be one more cultural factor uh, inspiring them to have a low, low fertility rate. Um, that's about as far as my poor brain can go on that one. Does somebody else have an observation? Over here, hang, hang on for the... Make sure you repeat the question too. The, <laughs> oh, sorry. I, I, the, the audience, the remote audience can't hear when people speak in the classroom. So I don't, sorry if that was weird. It's okay. Uh, the, the, the very erudite comment was uh, back in the 60s, uh, a gentleman named Paul Ehrlichman, or Paul Ehrlich, wrote a book called The Population Bomb in which he uh, strongly argued that the population was going to increase and agriculture couldn't keep up. Um, and uh, obviously he was wrong, at least so far. Does that perhaps contribute to today's um, questioning of science, today's skepticism about whether scientists are correct? Did I summarize your, okay. Uh, I read that book when I was in, at Michigan State. Um, and uh, yeah, he was wrong. There was another book written shortly afterwards called The Coming Ice Age. Um, and they also made a strong argument for why the world was gonna get colder and colder. Um, does that contribute to skepticism about science? Probably. Um, does that mean that we should be skeptical of the demographic projections? Maybe. Yogi Berra was right. Predicting the future is hard, especially in advance. Thank you. Um, we have a comment. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, we have, just have a couple of comments in the chat. Um, one that this reminds me of Dan Brown's origin, uh, where, where the plot involves forced infertility of a percentage of young adults. So she's reflecting back on the infertility discussion. Um. Yeah, certainly. Uh, the question was, Dan Brown has written a book, I think, called Origins, uh, that the plot element involves uh, forced sterilizations or whatever of, of young women. Um, that probably is uh, based on the history of what happened in China. And could that ever happen again? Who knows? Mm -hmm. Uh, David Blatt asks, uh, what is the median age in the U.S. and what is the influence of starvation as a weapon of war? I don't need to repeat that question, do I? No. I um, if I'm speaking, then the remote people can hear yeah. me. Thanks. Um, I don't know what the median age is in the United States, but I do know that the median age is increasing because 
I'm on the front edge of the baby boom, and many of you people are right in the middle of the baby boom. And uh, when we first came on the scene, we lowered the median age in the United States. And as we aged, we raised it. So uh, the median age in the US has definitely increased. Um, I have Google because um, I'm at my computer in 2019, which is the last report, at least according to the search, it was 38.1 years. 38.1. Uh, that sounds very similar to another country we talked about just a moment ago, China. Uh, we have a question in the chat. Will you be discussing the white nationalist great replacement theory? I didn't quite hear you, Susan. Um, we have a question that um, asking if you will be discussing the right or the white nationalist great replacement theory? No. Okay. And I think that covers all the questions. There's okay, we have comment. one here in the classroom. Okay. Well, mm -hmm. um, could you speak? Oh, sorry. Okay, I, I believe the Zoom people were not able to hear that, so I'll try to repeat it. Uh, her observation was that uh, in the example of Brazil, uh, people were able to uh, take personal responsibility far better when the government provided electricity in the favelas. And uh, her point is that governments or, or cultural leadership has a role to play in helping people to uh, to be personally responsible. Is that a fair summary? Okay. Could um, could you talk about in terms of agriculture keeping up when there's deliberate uh, again utilization of, of starvation as a weapon of war? You know what when it's not that the food isn't there, but that that there's active human obstruction of distribution. Yeah, um, it is certainly true that. Uh, withholding food and uh, trying to starve out uh, oppressed population groups is a weapon of war. Um, and in a sense, that's, that's, almost, that's almost irrelevant to the topic of demography because um, wars, no matter how they're fought, no matter how you try to uh, kill the, the enemy group, Wars reduce population. Uh, that has always been a factor. Uh, using food as a weapon to kill people is just another way of doing it. Uh, the, the big issue for demography is whether or not the food supply globally can keep up. Um, and there, you know, I, I think there's a lot to be optimistic about. Uh, it has been observed that you know, 40% of the food in the United States ends up being wasted or lost because of losses in transportation and because some of us put it in the back of the refrigerator for a month and then throw it away. Um, if, if these kinds of inefficiencies can be dealt with, the supply problem can, can be handled. Uh, whether or not bad actors in, in governments and in wars will use food as a weapon is a separate issue. Thank you. The observation here is that government doesn't seem to have a great deal of uh, 
of effectiveness in, in uh, affecting population growth. And that's a good observation. Um, certainly when a government launches a program such as the, uh, the one child policy in China, th that was enforced in such brutal ways that yes, it did have an impact. But certainly there are lots of examples in Europe. Uh, perhaps some of you have seen the, uh, the video or the government of, I think it's Norway or maybe it's Sweden, uh, but a European country that is experiencing low fertility and um, population decline actually has put out um, television messages suggesting that people should, you know, do it for the good of the country. <laughs> um, and uh, one travel company has uh, supplemented those videos by saying, you know, more people get pregnant on vacation than they do when they're at home. We have vacation packages to help our country. Uh, but in general, you know, governments can only attempt to influence culture. Culture is what determines what people do. When the cultural expectation is that, that you will have a large family, barring something as brutal as the, as the Chinese experiment, people are going to do what culture expects them to do. So you're right, governments have limited influence, except to the extent that they can influence culture. Sir. When you collect that, there was a think tank called the Club of Rome. And back in the 60s, uh, I know there was one of the publications titled The Limits to Growth. Mm -hmm. In the book, they gave the results of their research, was, which was to project availability of a host of items future populations, such as petroleum resources, coffee, fire, agricultural fields, and so on. Has some organization like it taken its place and is that information available in a place other than the UN, for example? Boy, that's a great question. Uh, to my knowledge, no organization. Oh, I'm sorry, I should have repeated the question. Um, the question was, Back in the, in the 60s and 70s, there was an organization called the Club of Rome, which was an international think tank. Uh, and they published some reports in which they uh, tried to estimate what natural resources, such as food, petroleum, copper, et cetera, uh, might be insufficient for future populations. And the question was, is, any, is there currently any organization now that uh, has taken that place? I don't think there's any organization like the Club of Rome now. The closest would be the Davos Conference, which is, I think, an annual or, or biannual event. Um, but they don't, they're not publishing any books. Um, that's a great question. And I wish, I wish the answer was yes. Uh, my question kind of uh, relates to the The question is, what about water and water shortages? What is their impact on um, population change? That's another good observation. Um, demographers have not identified water shortage as being a global issue, but certainly hydrologists and ecologists have said that uh, we are putting a lot of pressure on the, uh, the water tables, certainly in this country. Um, whether that will affect people's decisions about fertility is a good question. I don't know that anybody has even addressed that. Maybe they should. Well, agricultural research, so, you know, there's growing some type of product right now, Is that going to be a positive influence in that kind of population control? The question is, uh, what about agricultural research, especially hydroponics, where uh, crops are being grown, say, in a building instead of in a field with far less water, uh, far less resources? Will that be a factor on food supply? Um, I think the answer is ultimately 
yes, but you'll have to remember that uh, currently, I mean, you know, we, we have a, um, a factory farm just a few miles from here. And, and I think it's Caledonia um, is where uh, we have uh, Revolution Farms. And uh, they actually have a viable business growing certain very high value things like um, parsley. Uh, but in general, uh, so far, the, the economic viability of growing, say, soybeans or, or sweet corn in that method, uh, it just hasn't worked out. Uh, likewise, there's uh, a lot of movement toward uh, farming of fish rather than simply trying to catch it in the ocean. Um, if you go to Meyer today, you get your choice between wild caught and farm raised. Um, that probably has a greater potential to increase food supply simply because it's economically viable. Uh, it, it turns out that you can make money raising salmon and, and other things in a farm pond. Uh, but hydroponics are, are all technically feasible and economic, ec ecologically they're great, but economically they're not quite there. I suspect we're getting very close to 11 o'clock. Well, that concludes the session for today. I think I'm on. Um, thank you very much for coming. Be sure to come back next Wednesday. I think Gary did a tremendous job again today. He always does. Thank you so much. And for those of you um, at home, have a wonderful afternoon. This was terrific. This was great. <laughs>